so much. We have gone through a transformative time in medicine with the advent of genomic medicine. Why don't we start by summarizing what this means and uh, why it has been transformative? Yes, yes, we're just starting to see the beginnings of this, aren't we? Um, it's remarkable that medicine has come so far when all we've had to deal with is recognizing the outward manifestations of disease uh, with, with very little uh, contribution from genomics or genetics in routine clinical practice. We know that any uh, disease is the product of the interaction between the environment and a person's genetic makeup. Up until very recently, we had lots of information about those environmental factors, but apart from a very small subset of diseases, we were in the dark about the genetic contribution. Um, and so now genomics gives us the opportunity to start to get that uh, additional information. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's why we're starting to, that's the basis of the transformation, isn't it? It is, it is. And I think j just for everyone to understand what the benefits are, I think it's important to remember that being able to make a genomic diagnosis in a patient not only very often can lead us to find a treatment that is much more specific and sometimes curative for the patient, but it also brings about very significant, often intangible or, un or unappreciated benefits. And I think um, many people with, or, or families that have had children with serious disabilities understand the importance of reaching a diagnosis because conventional medicine often hasn't been able to do this and kids go under numerous rounds of diagnostic assays and fail treatments. Um, so that closure with a label, the name of a disease, can yes. really uh, yes. decrease the anxiety enormously. And importantly, it also rep very often offers reproductive options to families that would otherwise might not choose to have more children because of the fear that they might have another child with a similar disease. So, so genomic medicine can really change lives of families and patients with genetic yes. diseases very significantly. Yes, so it's, it's an exciting time, this, and we're just getting a glimpse of the true potential, aren't we? Um, looking at where genomics can be applied to, at the moment, still a relatively small number of cases, mostly those diseases that are caused by just one gene going wrong. But before the advent of whole genome sequencing, many of those patients remained undiagnosed because we still didn't know where in the genome to look. And now that we can look at the entire genome, we can resolve those. But there are lots of um, obstacles, aren't there, still to be overcome to realise the potential that we're starting to get a glimpse of. Would you like to outline some of those obstacles? Partly, um, we need a very strong bioinformatic effort and we are only now developing the right tools. I think there has been uh, some effort in trying to establish um, groups that are specialised at bioinformatics, but I think it needs a long-term planning with um, quite a bit of infrastructure and funding dedicated to this. It's important to emphasise, isn't it, that the genome's quite a big thing. Um, so, um, you know, three, three billion signals in the genome, three billion A, C, Ts and Gs. Um, sometimes one of those three billion can be swapped and that's sufficient to have a devastating effect. Um, but of course, identifying that one in three billion uh, is really uh, one of the major obstacles. And as you say, um, the data management, the interpretation of the data which is achieved through bioinformatics expertise is, is one of those big problems. Um, but then of course, we don't know too much about the significance of most of those one in three billion changes, do we? Particularly where, when they don't occur in the coding parts of the genome, in the 1% the of the genome that makes protein. Yes. We do know that probably a significant number of them lie in regions that are less well understood, that determine how the proteins are assembled together or are, the expression is regulated. And of, obviously the other big obstacle is trying to understand how, as you say, genes interact with our environment and how, you know, 
infections and other environmental challenges change expression of some yes. of these genes or trigger some of these genetic defects to manifest. Yes, yes. Now, I think it's important to acknowledge that some areas have benefited more than others in this um, very rapid race to genomic diagnosis. Immunology has been one of, the, of those. Do you want to explain a little bit why? Well, clinical immunology is characterised by a diverse group of diseases, um, which is so typical of what we were talking about at the beginning where we, up until still the current time, most, uh, mostly, uh, we make a diagnosis based on a constellation of clinical manifestations rather than understanding the underlying mechanisms. And this, is, um, this has been a source of frustration for scientists, clinicians, and most of all patients, I'm sure, that um, we, despite our tremendous understanding of the immune system, understanding the mechanism of immune disease has been lagging behind. Uh, but now as we're starting to um, tease apart the mechanisms through genomics, um, then it has um, the potential for enormous benefits because as we know, um, there are lots of um, precision therapies available to target the immune system if we can just identify which patients are most likely to benefit. Um, so just worthwhile making this distinction between precision medicine, personalised medicine and genomics, I think. Uh, so genomics is the, is the uh, method for identifying the genomic variation. Um, precision medicine is where we have a medication that is targeted to a single molecule. We bring those two together when we can identify the patient that might benefit from um, that precision therapy. And then when we do that, then it becomes personalised medicine. And so at the moment, we've got lots of precision medicines still which are being used, but not in a personalised way. And as we make further progress with genomics, we can start to personalise that therapy. And so, um, yes, yeah, so immunology is really um, right for uh, this analysis. And there is good evidence that, um, I mean, we already know over 300 genetic causes of immune diseases. And I would like to stop and make a bit of a reflection on, on, on why have we advanced so rapidly as well. And part of it is because there's been extraordinary basic science performed in the field of immunology. And we have to say that Australia has been right at the leading edge of that research. And I think it's important to, to acknowledge this because without that preliminary work, that deep understanding of immune cells, molecules, how they work, we would never be able to make this um, definitive genetic diagnosis if we didn't really understand how these mm -hmm. proteins work mm -hmm. in many cases. And I think that says a lot about also this investing seriously in basic science. I think there is now a little bit the risk that we are putting a lot of emphasis into any type of research that is very applied, that has immediate outcomes. And while it is essential that, you know, taxpayers' funding is directed to research that's going to make a difference, we would not be able to make a difference if there hasn't this been very intentional investment yes. in understanding yes. basic cellular processes and mechanisms. Yes. And um, I mean, I think that if there's one message we would like to, I would like to leave here today is that given that there's been this very generous and important funding through MRFF for very clinically applied projects, that we think carefully about protecting seriously funding for blue sky research that we know we'll maintain this pipeline of discoveries that will make Australia still be successful and at the leading edge and making yes. a difference to patients in 15 and 20 yes. years.